Uh, so glad to have you here. Visitors, so glad to have you here. Um, we just love him, amen? We just love the Lord. Oh. And next Sunday, you don't want to miss. Uh, we do need your help. We, uh, uh, we've got Albert coming in, one million souls saved, half a million people healed. Say it a number of times. My wife knocked me out of the way and said, "Don't get in my way." Did you see that? <laughs> watching legs grow, people watching on the internet, calling their family. We had people at six o'clock leaving Greenville and and leaving other locations and coming here. So it's going to shift and change a little bit, but it's going to be a great time. Um, there's a group out of Florida that have been coming up. This will be their ninth year. They've been praying. There's about 32 coming up. They've been praying and interceding that God would open the wells here in this region. Uh, Doug and Jennifer both have roots into this area. Uh, Doug back almost 250 years. Jennifer 120 years. So they are praying that God will do everything that he has promised he's going to do. Amen. So I invite you tomorrow night to come out for prayer. We're really interceding, praying. Um, The enemy is not happy about what's going on, let's just say that, but greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. And the promises of God are yea and amen, and we shall tread on the lion and the serpent. Amen. One of my favorite, favorite, favorite movies to watch is Mission Impossible. I love the impossible. For those that are real righteous, just pray for me. But one of the mission statements says when he's given the mission, if you choose to accept this mission, and basically if you're called, this government will deny all knowledge and responsibility for you. I want to tell you that the mission we have, God accepts all responsibility <laughs> and gives us all authority and all the power to do it. God began speaking to me last week and, and, and this week about Isaiah 60 verses 1 through 4, and I'm going to get into that in a minute. But this morning when I came in early to begin to study and, and pray, and, and uh, as I normally do very early in the morning, I opened it up, and Bethel Supernatural School of Ministry sent out this email, and it says, As a team was praying for you this month, we felt these words flow from our spirits. Arise and shine. There's a renewal of vision and an expectation coming. We feel the excitement of heaven as the brightness of his glory comes over you in this season. The passage is taken out of Isaiah 61 through 3. It's the, um, the Passion Translation. It says, Rise up in splendor and be radiant. For your light has dawned and Yahweh's glory now streams from you. Look carefully. Darkness blankets the earth and thick gloom covers the nations. But Yahweh arises upon you and the brightness of his glory appears over you. Nations will be attracted to your radiant light and kings to the sunrise glory of your new day. In, in this email it says, if you continue reading, Isaiah 60, 17 says, I will replace your copper with gold, your iron with silver, your wood with copper, and your stone with iron. Where things might have become routine, he is polishing and bringing a new sparkle. We felt upgrades are coming to you. As you lead and lean into this season, you'll be strengthened and fortified. We are praying for you and declaring an awakening over your dreams and over your cities. As I said last week, I was talking with a pastor in the area, and he says, are you seeing a shift? I said, I'm seeing a shift, and sometimes a double shift per week. We just went into another shift this morning. There's a greater expectation of what God's doing. There's a greater longing for what God's going to do. And, and he is wanting to shine his light upon us. But Mike Bickle says, uh, International House of Prayer, there are two types of people. There's lovers and there's workers. I just want you to know more is done through love. More is done through love than it is just being a worker. Often a worker is a hireling. They come for what they get. A lover comes because he loves what he's doing. He loves the Lord. He ministers out of love and not out of anything else, but that God receives the honor and the glory. And then 
A lover is one that is presence focused. Lovers in the Bible uh, look to the word, look to the presence of God, look to the obedience of God. They want to live in the glory of God because this next outpouring is going to be hosting the presence of God, a habitation of the presence of God. It's going to be literally, and we're going to see in scriptures in a few minutes as we look at situations in the New Testament, where God is going to be so upon us that we're going to see major, major shifts as we go into the marketplace. Moses was told by God that an angel would lead him into the promised land, and each angel has an assignment to fulfill the mission to ensure that we conquer our enemies and we gain all that's ahead of us. We don't worship angels. You know, um, that's all I'm going to say. Moses would not live or move without the presence of God. It was always about his presence. In Exodus 32, 12 through 16, they'll have some of these scriptures, some of them they may not have. Then Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found grace in my sight. Now therefore I pray if I found grace in your sight, show me your way that I may know you and that I may find grace in your sight and consider that this nation is your people. And he said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And then he said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. For how then shall it be known that your people and I have found grace in your sight? Except you go with us, so we shall be separate, your people and I, from all the people who are upon the face of the earth. Moses knew that without God's presence, he could not accomplish the mission that God had given him. Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We believe that we are to be a presence-based culture, that we are to become a people so deeply anchored in Jesus Christ that we know without a shadow of a doubt whatever we're facing, wherever we go, that he'll never leave us or never forsake us. A lot of what I long for in life and many others is that we want to be so enveloped, so operating in the Holy Spirit that all the Holy Spirit has to say is speak and we will speak. But even more than that, that he doesn't even have to speak to us. We immediately know what's on the heart of the Father. Amen. Uh, that's a place that I'm praying to enter into and I'm praying for this house to enter into. So how is it possible that Paul, who was once a great persecutor of the church, becomes so filled with the presence of God in his work and in his worship that they could take the apron where he made tents and send it out and people will be touched. He'll just touch in the apron. Think about that. See, the, the, the worship that we do in the workplace, the worship we do as we do our everyday job brings glory and honor to the Lord and the presence and the glory of the Lord is there. He's making tents. He's supporting himself on the mission field. But in his worship and in his work, the presence of God so overshadowed him, so filled him, that they could take a piece of the apron and lay it on somebody and they would be healed. Peter could walk down the street and his shadow would heal people. The shadow has no sustenance in it. It is just a shadow. It was the presence of God in Peter walking down the street that people were healed and set free, that the demonic manifested and came out because they sensed and they knew the very presence of God. See, when our work becomes an offering to the Lord, when our worship becomes an offering to the Lord, when everything we do becomes an offering to the Lord, then we will walk in that presence, that habitation, that manifestation of the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? <laughs> oh, beware, Ashley, we're coming. <laughs> The church is on the move. The church is rising up around the world. The world is aching for a presence-based people that will say that the Lord is with you and grab them by the sleeve and say, I want to go with you because I hear God is with you as the prophetic word came to the Jewish. We live in a hopeless and broken world and people and circumstances 
and everything happens in their life, and the light of God in your life is the most powerful message that you can give to people who are hopeless and people in the business world. No matter how bad their life is, you demonstrate hope and healing and restoration through Jesus Christ. I want you to hear what I'm saying right now. That you have gone through a lot of stuff in your life, and I've ministered to a lot of you here. But when you come into complete healing and complete fullness of everything that God has for you, God is going to use you, and you're going to transform people after people, maybe communities and even nations, because you demonstrate the grace and the power and the love and the forgiveness of God. Arise and shine and let the glory of the Lord rest upon you. Let the glory of the Lord come out of you. Let the glory of the Lord touch people that you come into contact with. See, we have to get our eyes focused off of ourselves and on Him and His glorious light. Your mission is simple. Everybody say, my mission is simple. Number one, say arise. Arise. And number two is say shine. Shine. If you'll arise in God and you'll let His glory shine through you, you will transform the world in which you live. These two commands, arise and shine, are not passive. (laughs) They aren't sit on your derriere. They aren't listen to another teaching. It's not praying three, four hours a day. Those are all good things. It's getting up and it's letting the light of God shine through you. It's arising up out of the complacency, arising up out of the mediocrity, arising up out of the pain and the hurt, arising up out of all of that stuff and letting the glory of God shine through you, you who have been delivered from a great thing. Amen? I might feel this in a minute. Whew. Hmm. We need to cease walking with the world and align ourselves with God's mission. (laughs) The church is to be mission-oriented. It is to complete the heartbeat of God for His world, and that is that the whole world comes to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. We need to leave the compromise, and we need to realize that God is our all and our all. We are to shine. It's not only good enough to rise, but we must shine. We must get involved. We must become active. You are the only Bible some people will see by your lifestyle, but they're the only Bible they'll hear by your mouth. (laughs) I believe in lifestyle evangelism. I believe in it. But there comes a time that we have to say, there there are times that I will get to know someone because, as I often say, if I tell somebody I'm a pastor, which I don't like to tell people because it changes the relationship and the dynamics of it. I want people to see that I love God because I'm just a normal boy from Pickens, South Carolina. That I'm passionate about God. I don't need no stinking title. I don't. Now, I'm honored that many of you call me pastor, and and, and some of you have some other names for me, some good, some bad. It's okay. I'm not offended. I'm really not. But what I'm wanting to say is that when we understand that our life is God and God purchased us with a price and a purpose to bring His glory into the world in which we live. The power of our mission will only come as we understand the source of our light and are threatened by the presence of darkness. This message this morning isn't about the enemy. It isn't about the devil. It's about who is in us. It is about the glory of God, the power of God, the presence of God that resides in us when we accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior for those in the Pentecostal ranks, for those that were baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. And, you know, we can get into all kind of things that can be divisive, but I just want you to know that God has more for you than you're walking in right now. We're in the year of elections. Man, I hate election year. There's already been a forest killed and mailed to my house. <laughs> it is most vicious that I've ever seen it. And I want to tell you right now, and I often say it, the hope is not in the Republican Party, the Democratic Party, or the Libertarian Party, or the Who's Who's Party, or anything else. That's not our hope. Now, I believe you need to vote. I need you need, you need to blow, vote convictions. 
I will vote. I always vote because I've been given a privilege to vote. I can't complain about the government if I don't vote. I'll just be honest with you. Don't complain to me about something unless you're willing to do something about it. That's me. Just who I am. (laughs) Metal on, Greg. We need to stand up and we need to let God's light shine through our lives. And only when that light begins to shine in our lives, in our lives will it begin to dispel the darkness around us. It will overcome the chaos and it will bring peace in the area of confusion in people's lives. Matthew 5, 16 says, Let your light so shine before men that, you may, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. What are your good works? Doing what God's called you to do. I can pick on Richard. Richard's good works is in the midst of everything that he's going in trying to implement they're banking a new system and having 700 calls in one day and putting 60 hours in in four days. His goal was still to keep the presence of the Lord, to keep the peace of God, the presence of God in his life. See, life goes chaotic. And if we're all the time drawn away and we all begin to focus on the outside, we forget who's on the inside, and that's the Lord God Almighty. That's the Holy Spirit of God, the resurrection power of God that will strengthen us and empower us. Ephesians 2, 9 and 10 says, Not as a result of works that one should boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them, that God prepared beforehand. Arise and shine, because God has worked. He has prepared for you beforehand. Amen. Man, I'm glad you're back. At least I get an amen. Transforming our lives. It says, For behold, the darkness will cover the earth and the deep darkness of the people, but the Lord will rise upon you and the glory will appear upon you. (laughs) Living in God's presence will change our lives. Either we will turn from Him or we will pursue Him. Either we will live for Him Or we'll decide that the cost is too much. And like many other disciples that turned away when Jesus said, unless you eat my body and drink my flesh, you will have no part with me. And the Bible says that day many turned away from him. The gospel is good news. It is great news. And God is wanting to do so much. But he is wanting us. He's wanting to transform our lives so that we can transform our society. Amen. And listen to what it says. It says, and nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes round about and see. They all gather together. They come to you. Your sons will come from afar. Mine's coming from Spain. Amen. And your daughters will be carried in the arms. And then you will see and be radiant. And your heart will be thrilled and rejoice. Because the abundance of the sea will be turned to you. The wealth of the nations will come to you. The change that we look for. At Rafa, that we look for is that the region is shifted and changed, that our kids who are away from the Lord are returning to the Lord. Those who have been hurt and those who have been broken are restored and walk in fullness. I see God, uh, you know, I say it every week, and, and I never get tired of saying it, and I never get tired of bragging on the people at Rafa. We had such sovereign moves yesterday during the healing rooms. God did amazing things, and and... You know, I just love to hear the testimonies of what God's doing and the ministries here at Rafo. We do it because we know that God has called us and given us and anointed us to be His ambassadors to this community, to this group of body of believers that we live in and fellowship among. Amen? God's only light will be rising in us as He pours out His glory. Will we be recipients of His glory? Will we... Give His glory out into the world in which we live. Again, don't focus on government or organization. Focus on living a righteous life where you can. As people are touched by God's work in your lives, we must introduce them to the Lord. There will always be those who will reject God's light just as they rejected Jesus' miracles. It will either be because of religious biases or prejudices or hurts or deception and the list can go on. But our duty is to have a genuine hope for the worst of societies, that if they see light, they will change. When I see Asheville, I see a righteous city. I see 
as the prophetic words, a habitation of the presence of God, that people will come into this region. Why? Because there are many people that are praying and seeking, and God will honor the prayers of His people. Where two or three are gathered together in His name, He is there in the midst of them. There are righteous men and women praying all across this region. And, and this next coming weekend, there, there is a group of about 34 major uh, intercessors that will be coming from different organizations and they're coming into this region to pray. Most of them don't live here. But they're coming to pray for this region. Why? Because God has put it on their heart. If God is sending people into this region to pray for us, how much more should we pray and say, God, I want your kingdom come, your will to be done, here at Rafa, here in my life, here in my family's life, here in the astral region as you have determined it in heaven. See, that's where we have to live. That's where we have to be. See, the, the, the problem is with us. Uh, God's given us all things. All things He's given us, but we don't let the light shine forth because we let the darkness in. <laughs> How do we let the darkness in? We believe the lie instead of the truth. We believe what the enemy says. We allow the enemy to speak, the enemy to bring depression and anxiety and fear and all of these other things to us. Darkness will try to crowd out the very light that God's going to bring. And again, you know, we, we covet your prayers. I covet your prayers. The leadership covets your prayers this week because there is an invasion of heaven coming into the astral region. Amen? And we aren't carrying out our agendas. We're coming here solely for God's agenda, and that is to see His light and His presence and His kingdom come into the astral region, to dispel the darkness and see the sons and the daughters of God rise up in the authority and the power that God has called them to step into. Mm. Oh, hallelujah. Mm. Yeah. I can't stop now. I will in a minute. God is in heaven, I believe, weeping over the church today. Not just because of the divisions and all the stuff that really doesn't make any difference in light of eternity. I think he's weeping because he provided everything through his son, Jesus Christ. He provided everything we need through the Holy Spirit. That all gift, all power, all authority is available to us, but the church is not walking in what Jesus Christ purchased for her. Should be a few more amens. Because we get caught up in our theologies, we get caught up in situations that have happened in our past, and that determines our theology. That determines what we believe, and how we act. When the Scripture does not change, God's Word is true and sure. His promises are yes and amen. Mike and Leslie, and I didn't ask their permission, but since they shared it last week, I'll, I'll do it. They had been praying. Let me look at Leslie too. <coughs> Our sugar plum and cupcake. <laughs> The Lord had been, for six months, they had really gone, I mean, they've gone through the mill. Financially, physically, a number of things have happened, both of them. They go up to the conference. The guy calls out Mike and Leslie, and then not only did he do that, but he called out the particular problem that she had and the problem that he had, and then prophesied over them, and they get home. And there were two checks in the mail. And there was a phone call that something they'd been seeking for for a while was going to be resolved within 30 days. And so they went from a place of crying out for God to pour out in a mighty way. And they saw God do it in just that quick. Because they stood on the promises of God. Mike Malone went, uh, went to Nashville again. Came back cancer free. <laughs> they told that guy he's going to die so many times, he just laughs at him now. 
Whose report will you believe? We will believe the report of the Lord. We will believe what the Word of God says. And so in the difficulty, in the pain, in the whatever is going on in your life, arise and let the glory of God shine through. In your praise and in your worship, there will be victory. In your praise and your worship, the enemy cannot do anything with that because he cannot control your tongue. And if he takes your tongue, you still got your mind. <laughs> and I tell this often, I, I love Graham Cook. He just messes me up so bad. But he got a brain disease and he couldn't talk, he couldn't move for six months. But he's praying in his mind with what he can. And he says, God, if you ever heal me, I'm going to kick the devil's hind end from one end of this globe to the next. <laughs> and he has done that. <laughs> God healed him. So we face difficult times. We face a, a, a country right now that is torn almost down the middle. We have political parties that are lying and investing in lies and we don't know where the truth is anymore, but we know who is the truth. We know that God is God and that God will raise His people up in times and positions and that His glory will rise and it will shine out of them and they will bring hope to a disparaging nation. When this scripture was written in Isaiah, they were at their lowest point and God said, there's a time coming through the prophet Isaiah that I'm going to pour forth my glory and everyone will see it. Even though there's darkness in the world, I'm going to bring healing, I'm going to bring restoration and I'm going to bring abundance of finances. And what God said this, God is saying today we got to grab a hold of it people I battle all range of emotions during the week Mondays are tough for me I don't mind telling you I'm not confessing to the devil but Mondays are tough I know almost always on a Monday that the spirit of depression is going to come on me, but when I realize it, I tell it where to hit the road. And if I need help, because <laughs> sometimes how, how many of you know we need some help, right? I call somebody and they, they, they kick it off of me too. And so we need to be praying for one another. We need to be saying, God, I want you to do everything that you want to do in my life. I want to be a habitation of the Holy Spirit. I want to represent you that when I walk into a place, that the place shifts. That people are healed when my shadow goes by. That people are healed when I just reach over and I just barely touch them. That they're healed. And I don't have to tell them my name. I don't have to tell them, you know... <laughs> uh, I get so tired of looking. I'm the right, reverend, holy, righteous, apostle, prophet, deliverer of the world. That's not me. You know, these are names that you hear. Why do you have to tell anybody anything? That's it. Just say God loves you. I want to see the fullness of God comes into you. I'm going to read a prayer. Yeah, God's in reading prayers. Dear Father in heaven, we have the light, but those around us are in darkness. We have resources, but no understanding how to di distribute those resources. We are accountable, but often live irresponsibly. Lord, now is the time for your light to shine. Now is the time for you to shine brightly into our lives. Rid our hearts of every dark spot. Remove all those things that used to block your light from shining in our souls in its full glory. Now the time for the light is to shine forth in tremendous glaring light into the dark world. We must wait no longer. We must take responsibility that we have failed the world in bringing the light to them and we must now arise and shine. In Christ's name, amen. As we get ready to take communion in just a couple of minutes. Remember that communion is a celebration of the life, death, and resurrection and the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ to the right hand of the Father. 
It is a testimony to the life that it took Jesus Christ, the holy, righteous, the only begotten Son of God, to die for our sins and to fully pay the price for our sin. That was how God demonstrated his love to you and to me. It was through Jesus Christ. When we take communion today, literally, and I love to say it because there are millions of other brothers and sisters, they may not think like we do, look like we do, act like we do, exactly believe like we do, or smell like we do. But they've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And from what I read in the gospel, that's the only thing that's ever required. Nothing else. Yeah, we live a holy life. We live a separated life. Yeah, all of those things are in there. But the only thing that's necessary for my salvation is accept the Lord Jesus Christ. And you can't show me anything any different. So there are dominant denominations and movements and house churches across this world that will be celebrating the day because they've accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. So we'll join today millions of others, if not a billion other people, saying, Jesus Christ, we are believing that you are the answer for mankind and all of his sins, that you death was necessary, that we could be restored to the fullness of everything that God has for us, that we're restored to sons and daughters of God, that your body was beaten and broken, that we could be healed and set free and delivered, not only saved and accept you as our Lord and Savior, but we can walk in the freedom and the fullness of everything that you purchased on the cross. That's what we believe here. The lamb was never beaten. The lamb was never flogged. The lamb had to be without spot and without blemish representing Jesus Christ. But Jesus Christ was beaten. He was bruised for our iniquities. It's by his stripes that we are healed. And see, if we only let communion become just a memorial to us, then it becomes just that. It's just an act. It's just something that we do in hopes that Jesus may come back But for many in the church, it is an act of worship, an act of saying, God, I believe what you did then, you're going to believe now. If you'll listen to this passage in 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 34, it says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus Christ, on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after the supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep, or many have died. For if we judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world. Therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. But if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, lest you come together for judgment. And the rest I will set in order when I come. Notice the Apostle Paul is setting some things in order. People were coming in and they would have a love feast or what we would call a potluck. And they would come and there were those who had money and those that didn't. But they would hog the food. So the people who really needed the food the most were not able to eat. And then they would take communion, not discerning that it was the Lord's body, that, that it was more than an act of just a symbolism, because this is New Testament writing, okay? New Testament. Everybody say New Testament. New Testament. He said, many of you are sick and weak because you did not discern the body of the Lord. And then he said, many of you are asleep. Many of you have died. Now, see, it wasn't until Zwingli, and I, I, I teach this often, it wasn't until Zwingli and, and that separation that came out of the Catholic Church that communion became a once a month, once every six months, or once every year type thing because they were trying to separate as much as they could from the Catholic background and from the Catholic teachings. But Catholics believe in transubstantiation that the Communion actually becomes the body and the blood of the Lord. I don't know. The Lutherans believe, and I think it's 
comes substantiation, which it represents it spiritually becomes the body and blood of the Lord. I don't know. I just know that what Paul said in Corinthians is to the church. He was correcting a church in Corinth. He was correcting a church that walked in gifts, that walked in the power of God, that were seeing great things, but he had to correct certain things in the church. So he said, let a man examine himself. Now here we, pra- we practice open communion, and by that I mean that if you've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, we invite you to take communion with us because you're our brother, our, you're our sister in the Lord.